I went to high school in the early 2000s, specifically 2003 to 2007. I was in band, choir, and theater as well, so I was not popular by any means. I had a fair amount of friends, and high school was fun for the most part. I live in a small coastal town of Mississippi, so it's important to know that everyone pretty much knows everyone else here. Enough of that though. Let's get to the actual story. As I mentioned, living in South Mississippi, everyone knows each other, and I wasn't too popular in high school. I had this weird way of attracting the oddest people at school, however. I'm not talking about those that were goth or emo, but those that were genuinely weird. You know what I'm talking about. Those people that were on the creepy side. I, however, didn't think much of it, because I'm in my young high school mind that they were just misunderstood. This one guy that I met at school, let's call him Chip, was more of a creep than I thought. He would follow me around in the school, talking to me about random things. He was into the card game Magic, and would try to explain to me in great detail to my disliking. I would politely tell him that I was not interested and walk into my class. He made it a point to wait for me after each class and walk with me everywhere. He was a loner and I was starting to figure out why. I figured that he talked to me because I didn't tell him to screw off. My friends would give me grief about him and say that he was stalking me. I would laugh it off and say he was just a weird guy that didn't know better at all. To give a little backstory to this, I was pretty awkward looking in my freshman year and part of my sophomore years of high school as well. I'm tall, 5 foot 9 to be exact, and during that time I was having growth spurts. I was super skinny and had breasts way too big for my tiny frame. I had not grown into myself just yet. But okay, back to the story. He would tell me every day that I was the most beautiful person he had ever seen and wanted to be with me. I wasn't allowed to date at the time, so I would tell him that my parents weren't allowing me to date just yet. He told me that he would wait for me and that we would be together one day. I just brushed it off like I always did, not thinking anything of it. Fast forward to my junior year of high school, I finally filled out. I'm still slender, but I was finally getting some curves, and my breasts look much more proportional. I was driving home from school with my little sister in the truck with me. I had a red 1997 Ford Ranger XLT. I was turning off the road that my school was on, and there was an old Chevy that was following me. I didn't think much of it at the time, because several of my classmates lived close to me. There were a couple of main roads in my hometown, Highway 90, which is the beach highway, and Railroad as well. They run parallel to each other. We were driving down Railroad to our street, and the old Chevy truck was getting closer to us. It freaked my sister out, but I assured her that it wasn't anything to worry about. We pulled onto our street, and then to our driveway, and the truck passed us. My sister and I shook it off and walked inside. A few days later, we were pulling into our driveway after school and Chip was sitting on our front doorstep. He smiled at us and waved to me. My mom works in the morning as a weekday preschool teacher, so she was already home. I nodded at him and rushed my sister inside through the side door. My sister was in the seventh grade at the time. My mom just looked at me with this stern look and asked me why he was sitting on our front doorstep. I told her about him following me around at school and talking to me because he doesn't have many friends. She told me that he is not allowed to come back to the house and that I needed to ask him to leave. I told her that I would and I walked outside. I told him that he would need to leave and that my mom said that he wasn't allowed to come back to my house. He smiled and said okay, and then walked away. I got a really creepy feeling about him from then on. As usual, 
He would follow me around to school every single day. My senior year came, and I got a job at the same preschool my mom works at. I was at work one day, when I looked out of my classroom window, and I noticed the old Chevy truck parked in the parking lot by my truck. I got that same sick feeling that I got the day I told Chip to leave. I shook it off because I had a classroom full of kids. A few days later, there was a knock on my classroom door. Now, the way that the preschool was set up was in trailers with a large outside deck which connected each classroom. This was right after Hurricane Katrina and the old building was destroyed in the hurricane. My mom and the director were standing outside looking upset. I asked them what was wrong and my mom said that Chip was here looking for me. They found someone to cover for me and I stepped outside on the deck where he was standing. He approached me like he was going to give me a hug but I backed up and put my hands out in front of me. He stopped and looked hurt. I've been waiting for you, he said. I asked him for what. He told me that I am more than old enough to start dating and he felt that it was time that we start doing so. I told him that he was crazy and that I would not date him whatsoever. I gave the super long pissed off monologue that I won't bore you with. Basically I told him in so many words to screw off and don't come near me again. He pleaded with me and then got angry when I didn't apologize to him. I however stood my ground and he finally left. That was a huge mistake. I broke down and started crying. I was crying so hard that I didn't realize that I had literally hit the deck. My mom took me into the office building and then called the police. I relayed the conversation to them when they arrived and they took me to the station to give a formal statement and to have a restraining order put against them. I thought that was going to be the end of it, but I was wrong. A few years later, I have since graduated from high school and junior college. I was starting my first year at a four-year university. I was also working for an HVAC company as the office manager. Our office was in a modular home. My office was to the left of the door and there was a window in front of me letting me see who would walk into the door. The restraining order had been lifted because it was only for a couple of years. I was hoping that he had gotten the message and was going to leave me alone. Anyway, I was in the office and that's when I heard the door open. I was working on something in QuickBooks and politely said, I'll be with you in a moment. I finished what I was doing and looked up. I felt the blood drain from my face. It was Chip. I stared at him in horror. My boss had a shotgun in my office just in case someone tried to break in and harm me when I was alone. I happened to be alone at the time. I also had my boss's our Belgian Malinois Sam with me as well. Sam would greet me every morning and would stay by my side all day. He was two at the time. He sat up and growled at Chip and got closer to me. I asked him what he wanted. He stood in the small foyer and smiled. I'm still waiting for you. He turned around and then walked out. Sam barked at him and whined when the door slammed shut. I called my boss and told him what happened. He rushed back to the office and made sure I was okay. I told them that I was and was thankful that Sam was there with me. At the time, I was living with my boyfriend, now husband, and told them what happened. My boss told me that I could have Sam as my dog as long as I brought him to work with me every day. I thanked them because Sam had become really attached to me. I brought Sam home with me and still have him to this day. My boss's other dog had puppies. She was a pit bull and my boss gave me one of their puppies. We named him Breezy and he and Sam are best friends. I left the company after I was offered a job in the town I live in now. My boss told me that Sam was mine to keep and I was grateful for that. 
Fast forward a year. The last bit was in 2012 slash 2013. My boyfriend and I are now married. The wedding was beautiful and we have been happily married. I'm still at the job that I left my previous job for. I was leaving work one evening. It was early December 2014, so it was dark out when I left. My boss knew my former boss and lets me bring Sam with me to work. It's a small office that does exotic car repair. I was in the office by myself most of the time, but the garage was connected to the office. As I was leaving, Sam stopped and started barking and growling at something in the shadows by the office building. That was the last thing that I remember. I woke up in the middle of an abandoned park. It used to be a popular park where families would bring their kids to play on the swing sets. It was privately owned, and the man who owned it died, so it became abandoned. Needless to say, I couldn't tell where I was because it was so dark. I couldn't find my phone, or even my purse. I saw something moving in the distance. I realized that I was tied to the old swing set pole. The figure got closer, and I could see who it was. It was Chip. I screamed, but he rushed over and covered my mouth with his hands. I stared at him, in horror. I waited for you, he said. My eyes then got wide. I waited and waited, and waited, but you never came to me, and that's what upsets me. By this time, he had let my mouth go, and had turned his back to me. I wriggled my hands a bit to see if I could get free. I couldn't get my hands free, but I noticed that the pole wiggled. He still had his back turned to me, and was talking nonsense. I don't remember what he said, because that's when my adrenaline then kicked in. I had been taking kickboxing classes for some time now. I started the classes to get in shape for the wedding, and I loved it so I continued. I looked behind me, and I noticed that the pole that I was tied to was really short. I pulled it out of the ground quite easily, and adjusted myself to bring my hands in front of me. I quietly stood up and approached him. I swung my arms and heard the pole connect with his head. He then hit the ground with a thud. He was a large man, but not very muscular. I then ran to where I knew the road was and found his truck parked on the side of the road. I looked in and saw my purse and things on the passenger side. I found an old pocket knife on the driver's seat and cut myself free. He was an idiot and had left the keys in the truck as well. I thanked God for that. I then started the truck and peeled away. I went straight to the police station and I told them about what happened. They took my report and I called my husband to come get me. He came with my parents and we hugged and cried for a long time. I asked them where Sam was and if he was okay. Apparently when I blacked out, Sam attacked the guy and he beat him pretty badly. My boss found him and had called my husband after he couldn't find me. Luckily, they had taken Sam to the local vet ER. He was badly hurt, but he did survive. The police went to the site where I was, but they couldn't find Chip. He had disappeared. Fast forward to Valentine's Day 2015. We were celebrating at home with our dogs and cat Boz. I went to check the mail, and I saw a letter with no return address. I walked inside and opened it, and there was a small piece of paper that said, I'll be waiting for you. Needless to say, I dropped the note, and I cried. We took it to the police to add it to my case file. 2016 came and went without any issues. Until Christmas, I was getting ready to go to my parents' house while my husband put the presents in the car, I walked out of the house, ready to go, and my husband looked at me with a scared look on his face. He just looked at me and cut his eyes to a spot around the car. I walked around, and I saw Chip. 
He was holding a crowbar like he was ready to bash my husband's head in. I had my Bluetooth headset on, and I made sure that I was half hiding behind my car. I held my phone and dialed 911. I heard the dispatcher and said, Mama, it's me, Sarah. The dispatch asked me what the emergency was. I told her that we would be running late because an old friend had shown up. The dispatch asked what my address was. I said, Oh, I thought I had texted it to my sister already. I'm sorry. It's... And I gave her my address. She said that the police were on their way. I said, That sounds great. I'll see y'all in a bit. I hung up and smiled and apologized about that. He smiled and said that he was tired of waiting for me and wanted me to come with him now. I stood there and I told him no as he waved the crowbar side to side in his hand behind my husband's head. My husband is a very fit man. He quickly turns around and elbowed him in the head. At the time, the police pulled up and then arrested him. I gave them another statement along with my husband and they said that they would update us on the case. We went to my parents' house, spent some time with them, and then we went home. It's been some time since his arrest, and no word on what has happened. I keep looking over my shoulder in fear that he will be there. Sam doesn't leave my side. He goes with me everywhere that dogs are allowed to go. If Sam can't go, my husband does instead. I don't know what will happen, but I want to move on with my life. Maybe one day I will be able to. I remember what he said when they put him in the police car, by the way. I'm still waiting for you. I'll always be waiting for you. Update. I just got off the phone with my lawyer and he has not bonded out yet. The court date is set for February 7th. I will update after court. Update 2. Court was uneventful to a point. We heard statements from both his and my lawyers. They pleaded insanity on his behalf. He's not insane. I wanted my lawyer to push for life without possibility of parole. The judge said that we would have to obtain information to overturn the insanity plea. My lawyer is currently poring over school academic records as well as previous jobs that he has held to prove that he isn't insane. I've been trying to process this information for some time. I can't believe that they would try to pass him off as insane. But we will be back in court on Monday. It's Thursday night. I'll be home alone for the weekend. My husband and his best friend will be out of town for business. It'll be just me, Sam, and Boz. I'm nervous, but I know he is still in the county jail until our next hearing. I will update as soon as I can. My boss gave me Friday off so I can stay home in the safety and comfort of my home. We installed a state-of-the-art alarm system with cameras and everything else too. It makes me feel a little bit safer. I won't be going anywhere this weekend either. This was not what I wanted but it's better than him walking the streets and possibly trying to abduct me again. Update 3 It's been a while since I've updated this. My lawyer was able to temporarily overturn the insanity plea because of the information that he found. The judge told him to his face that he believed he wasn't insane but he was psychotic. There was no ruling because his lawyer doesn't think he is fit to be in jail but wants to put him in an institution so that he can get help. I think that he is beyond help and needs to be locked away for good. The judge said that they have to prove that he truly needs help and appointed a psychologist to run some extensive tests. I'm afraid that they will find him to be mentally unstable and put him in a mental health facility instead of jail. This is not how I wanted this to go. Either way, I will update again when I get some news. This all happened 11 years ago 
when I was 16 years old. All of my interaction with my creeper happened on the internet, so I hope this is the right place for this, and if this sounds a little disjointed, I apologize. This is the first time I've really talked about this. Edit. To add, I am female. I had a friend that introduced me to a guy she knew on the internet, and I started an instant message with him because she said he was a friend of a relative. A lot of my friends were talking with him at the time, and me and the friend even video chatted with him once. I had a computer in my room at this time, so I talked to him a lot more than my parents realized at the time. Well, the I aming session slowly started to get more sexual. He had convinced me that I shouldn't stay at my home and that I should run away. He had also convinced me to break up with my boyfriend at the time. This guy had my stupid 16 year old self completely brainwashed. My friend that introduced me to him was also going to run away with me and we were going to meet the guy in New York. So we arranged it so that I can spend the night at her house that night so we can run away together. That night, we sneak our stuff outside and go out for a walk. We were going to walk to the bus station and get tickets all the way up there. We walk a while but weren't going to make the bus so we looped back around to her house. At this point, she decides that she isn't going to go but convinces me that I should still go. So in the morning, I leave the note for my parents and I call a taxi. It picks me up and drives to the bus station. The driver knew that something was up and he was casually questioning me about where I was going and who I was going to meet. We got to the bus station and I go inside to buy my ticket. I'm sitting there as the clerk is getting my ticket ready and my dad pulls up like a bat out of hell. To this day, I am grateful I left that note. He had a hunch that I was going to the bus station and drove so fast that his Astro van was on two wheels at some point. My dad gets me and my stuff and we head home. At this point I realized just how stupid I had been and I broke down. My parents asked me all the questions about what was going on and why. They also call the cops. A few months go by and an FBI agent calls them wanting to talk to me and also take the computer. My mom and I talk to the agent for a while and he informs us that they believe they have the same guy in custody right now for luring other girls to him. He showed me his photo and I ID him as the same guy. He takes my computer but they don't find anything on it but a few conversations since the friend that introduced me to him had wiped it pretty good. Luckily they didn't need me in court to convict this guy. They had some other girls that made it all the way to him. To this day, I am grateful that I left that note and that my dad listened to his instincts and found me before I got on that bus. I also found out that the cab driver waited outside where I couldn't see him because he figured out I was a runaway. I believe he even called the cops and was waiting for them to show up. That man will always have my gratitude. And I was lucky enough that after we told my boyfriend what happened, we got back together. We have been married for 8 years now and have a little girl and you can bet she will never have a computer in her room and I will tell her this story when she is old enough. So I don't know if you will all view this as an overreaction on my part, but this really shook me up. Let me know what you all think. Between August 2012 and June 2013, when I was 20 years old, my boyfriend Ryan was living abroad in Trieste, Italy as a teacher. We're both from New England and I was unfortunately stuck at home for my junior year of college. Ten months 
is a long time to be in a long distance relationship. So for Christmas, my parents told me I could go visit Ryan over his February holiday, which fell on his birthday, as well as Valentine's Day. In short, it was perfect. When the time came, I sat at the airport and said a quick goodbye and happy birthday to Ryan via text message as I knew that I wouldn't have service on the flight or at all in Europe. He wasn't able to meet me at the airport because of work, so he texted me directions about what to do when I landed in Trieste. The directions went something like this. When you land, go out to the buses, get on the sea bus, and take it for about 45 minutes. At the end, you'll be at a train station, and I'll meet you there. It wouldn't hurt to get a map or ask someone for directions if they speak English, but if you follow my directions, you should have no problem. This all seemed pretty straightforward to me, but as I was sitting on the bus, I couldn't help but feel I had done something wrong. You know how it is. When you're helpless, you always assume the worst, and I was pretty helpless in a foreign country with little knowledge of the language and also no traveling companion. So naturally, I was worried. I decided to try to communicate with the woman next to me just to calm my nerves. Scusi, uh, inglesi? Parle inglesi? She made a face and held up her fingers to show she spoke a little English. Oh, uh, grazie. I'm looking for the train station. Stazione treno. Dove? I pulled out my map, and she smiled immediately and said, Si, si, vengo con me, which I'm pretty sure means, come with me. And even if it doesn't, she seemed to know where I wanted to go, and after viewing the map, how could she not? About 15 or 20 minutes into the ride, the bus stops in a really sketchy looking part of the city. The woman stood up and made a come here gesture with her hands. I looked around at the buildings outside and didn't see a train station anywhere. Ryan had been adamant that I wouldn't miss it at all, and I'd only been on the train for half the time he said I would be. Alarm bells started going off in my head. This woman was being so insistent, yet she knew exactly where I wanted to go because I'd shown her the map, and this clearly wasn't it. Then she grabbed my arm and tried to pull me out of my seat. I was not having any of this. I said, No, no grazie, ciao, ciao, and waved goodbye. She looked really irritated, but she seemed to give up. I heard her mutter something I couldn't understand in Italian, and that's when five dudes stood up from all different parts of the bus and got off with her. The six of them were clearly together, yet she had sat next to me and had not once talked to any of them over the course of the 20-minute bus ride. I was more than a little creeped out, but I made it to my stop without any further incident about a half hour later. I mentioned my experience to Ryan, and the two of us laughed it off, joking that I could have ended up like the girl in Taken. I'm pretty sure I was just overreacting, but sometimes I really wonder. Italy, Trieste in particular, is known for human trafficking. A huge ring was just busted in May of this year. I feel like lonely young foreign travelers are probably pretty easy prey for them, and luring a young girl in with a woman and then using men to strong arm her just doesn't seem so far out of the realm of possibility. Bad people or not, it was pretty scary for me, and I'm glad I had enough sense to stay on the bus. Who knows where I'd be now. So, sketchy Italian lady and friends, let's not meet. So, I hadn't thought I'd have any other contributions for this subreddit, thank god, until a friend and I were swapping retail horror stories the other day 
and I was reminded about another time that someone gave me a gut feeling to run. For context, at the time, I was a teenager working at a small coffee shop a short walk away from my house as a barista, which involved forcing myself to be always bubbly and smiling, despite the idiocy that transpires before some people get their coffee. As a result, I've had a few experiences where men take friendliness as flirting and try their luck on me, but no one as creepy as this guy. He came in on a late Sunday afternoon shift when I was working alone as my co-worker was far too sick to be touching food and went home early. He was dressed in an unassuming leather jacket and jeans and looked to be in his early 40s. After ordering a small coffee and paying with small change, he starts to try to hit on me over the counter and I just brushed it off and hand him his coffee. Then he tells me he recognizes me and that I must be from the area. I've never seen him before so I kinda laugh nervously and deny it and then he gets weirder. Then I've definitely seen you on campus. Do you go to this college? I say no given I've never heard the name before in my life. How about this college? Nope. Definitely that college then. Still, no. This goes on for over 10 minutes, and he's listed at least 8 different schools that I've only recognized one of, and it's clear that there's no way he's a student at any of them. Then he moves around to the small door that opens to let us out from behind the counter to clean the shop, and tries to get past it to come closer to me. Something really feels off. So I tell him a little forcefully that customers aren't allowed back here. He kinda laughs and makes a comment about how he knows he's not just a regular customer and I'm just playing hard to get. I repeat again that no, he isn't allowed back here and his face instantly becomes serious and he totally shifts gears. So you're probably working until closing, huh? What time do you guys close? I follow my gut and I lie that we closed at 2am, when in reality it was 10pm, given it's a Sunday, and he nods and then tells me, then I'll come back at 2am for you, and finally leaves. Given I've served some strange people at my time there, I try to push it out of my mind and focus on work for the rest of my shift. My manager wasn't there at the time like usual. He only ever came in on Thursdays or Fridays, so I didn't get a chance to bring it up until then. When I did on my next shift, he invited me to come into the office and watch the night security tapes just to ease my mind. And guess what? Creepy dude had actually come back at 2am in a beat up Honda on a Sunday night and the cameras caught him forcefully trying the front door and also crouching along the windows of the cafe to try and see past the shades we put down at night. Eventually, he stormed back into his car, which was one of only two cars in the lot, and then sped off. I have no clue what his intentions were in trying to meet up with a teenage girl at 2am on a Sunday, but I've never seen him since, and I sincerely hope we never meet again. We moved into a house in the country about four months ago. Since we'd previously lived in an apartment, that means we needed to buy a lawnmower. Instead of putting out 200 plus dollars on a lawnmower, however, when we have to move in a few years, we decided to hire somebody to cut our grass. Initially, we went with a guy that my fiancé used to work with, but $65 every two weeks does start to add up, and I was looking for something cheaper. That brings me to Charles. Charles posted in my Facebook classified that he was looking for some lawns to cut this weekend, and he had a reputable company. 
so I sent him a message. Initially, Charles came off as nice. He asked for my address so he could stop by and give me an estimate. After stopping by my house, he sent me a message saying, Damn, sweetheart, you got a big porch. It made me kind of uncomfortable, but figured I was overreacting and started planning when he could come out. I told him my days off, but he assured me I didn't have to be home, so I told him to come Wednesday. Wednesday morning, he messaged me and said, Are you home? I replied, No. Three hours later, he says, Are you home yet? I told him, No, I won't be home until after 8. Charles then informed me his tire had a flat and he could come by tomorrow. Thursday, first thing in the morning, he messaged me and said, Will you be home today? I told him, no. He messages back a few hours later. Hey, are you home? I said, no, I told you I wouldn't be home all day. Are you still coming out? He then told me his truck broke down. He was sending messages like, please don't be upset with me, sweetheart. At this point, I was getting really creeped out. I told him just to come tomorrow, Friday. It's actually my day off, but I woke up and left the house for the day. He messages me and says, Hey, I'm coming. You're off today, right? I said, Yes, but I'm not home. When will you be home? I don't know. He messaged me later saying, Sorry babes, was loading the equipment onto my truck and it fell back and broke. Maybe I can come tomorrow. At this point, I was really creeped out and I told him, Never mind, I'm going to find somebody else. Saturday, I get off work around 4 or 5 and check my phone, and I find multiple messages from him saying that he had cut my grass and I need to come home and give him the money. I told him, no, I'll cash app it to you. He started getting really irate and saying that I need to give him the money now. I told him I would give the money after I got home and thought the grass was cut. I was honestly really worried he would be waiting at my house, so I got a friend to drive home behind me. He wasn't there. I sent him the money, and I thought that was the end of it. Fast forward to two months later, I'm on the phone with my fiancé as I drive to class, and he tells me he has to get off the phone because there's somebody walking down our driveway. I asked what he meant and he said there was a man walking around in our driveway as well as front yard. After I got to class, he texted me telling me it was just a man who had come by to promote his lawn care business. I didn't think anything about it as it had been two months, but later that night I got home and saw a business card laying on my counter with the name of the man who had been messaging me earlier. I called my fiancé, Mike, at work and asked how the guy had been acting. He said Charles seemed genuinely surprised that a man had come out and asked if he lived alone. I asked Mike if the man had stopped at any other houses and he replied with, Now that I think about it, no. After he left our house, he just left. Mike said he had seemed really desperate to help around the house and even offer to cut the lawn, fix our porch, remove any trash or scrap metal we had around the house, and then asked if we had pests such as bats in our attic or anything else. That especially freaked me out as we do have a bat problem and I had previously posted about it on Facebook. Mike then said what was really weird is Charles was very freaked out about the dog. He heard Max barking from inside and started asking a lot of questions like, is he a big dog? Does he stay outside? Or does he stay inside? Does he ever go outside? Or is he a stay inside completely? How big is he? Is he nice? Mike chalked it up to him being scared of dogs. He gave him a brief tour of the outside of the house and then Charles got in his truck and left. I then told Mike that this was the same guy who had been messaging me earlier in the year 
and Mike began to freak out. He said that Charles had asked a lot of really specific questions, such as who all lived here, how long they lived there, and where they were at the time. He said he tried to brush this off, but Charles seemed really insistent to know if Mike was the only one in the house. Before he left, Mike specifically asked him if he had cut the lawn here before, or something like that, and maybe was thinking of the last owners. But Charles told him, No, I just happened to be out this way and thought I'd promote my business to the neighborhood. The worst part, I had taken my fiancé's car to work that day, which means my car was in the driveway when Charles stopped by. He thought I was home alone. I didn't contact the police, because I thought I might be overreacting. By the way, this all happened two days ago, and I really hope that we never meet again. So, this just happened, and I'll give you a bit of background of the last 25 minutes. I just got home from a reasonably big night. It's 4.30 a.m., and stinking hot in this part of Australia right now. I walked in the door and opened the fridge and was so happy to find three icy cold beers in the fridge. I take two of them and walk upstairs to bed to read and drink myself into a boozy sleep. First issue, the beers are not twist tops. They need a bottle opener. And after some sloppy drunken attempts at using the handle of the drawer of my bedside table, I head back downstairs to use an actual bottle opener. I turn on the kitchen lights, which are so bright that they make the space behind my eyes burn. I squint around to find the bottle opener, which I can't find, so I use the solid edge of a large kitchen knife. It is a risky choice, but the bottle cap is now off the beer, and I'm happy. I turn off the alien blinding kitchen light and I go to head upstairs, but something through the front window of my house that looks onto the street catches my eye. I stop at the bottom of the stairs, and all the hairs on the back of my neck and arms stand up. I turn my head slowly, and my eyes and brain are trying to make sense of what I'm looking at. It looks like a rain-drenched woman in a fancy white dress who is gazing at me through the window. Oh shit, it actually is. I pause and take the longest inhale of my life. She's glaring at me like she hates me. She has mascara running down her face and she is drenched from the rain. Her arms are extended and she's leaning her head towards me like her body language was trying to say, Look at me. Look at what you've done. I'm shitting bricks, but the rational side of my brain kicks in and I think, shit, is she okay? Does she need help? I slowly walk over to the window, her gaze still locked onto mine. We are now literally within one meter of each other. I state loudly through the glass, are you okay? Do you need help? Is anyone with you? Then it dawns on me, my gate is locked and there is an eight foot high fence which is very difficult to climb. How did she get in? She doesn't respond to my inquiry. She just keeps that hateful look in her eyes. We stood there for about another 30 seconds. I was looking around nervously trying to make sense of this, and she was just glaring into my soul. And then, she finally opened her mouth as if to say something, finally. But it wasn't words that came out of her mouth. It was an insanely high-pitched, Meow. And then she starts clawing at the window with her novelty sized fingernails. What the hell? I'm frozen and I don't know what to do. She's clearly not very well. Not very well at all. Then, in the background behind the fence, I see another woman, 20 something year old, dressed in a short black club dress with the glow of her phone lighting up her face. She sees the woman in white at my window and yells, Michelle, you pissed bitch. That's the wrong damn house. The rain-soaked slash nightmare 
slash Catwoman's eyes go from I hate you and I want you to die to Oh my god, I'm so sorry and I'm embarrassed. And she runs over to the fence and impressively, Army Commando flings herself over. I can then hear a group of ladies pissing themselves, laughing, and saying how Jason's house is number 25, not 23, you idiot. That poor guy is probably going to call the cops now. All I know is that I am so happy that I was not on the receiving end of a misdirected prank, and I didn't have to be killed by a well-dressed hybrid cat demon woman. And now, I have to go back down to the kitchen to open my other beer, but I'm still too afraid to do that. I'm female, 31 years old, states away from home, on a business trip, about an hour ago, around 8.30pm here. I just got in back to my room from a work dinner. I heard shuffling in the hallway and then peeked out the peephole. I saw a figure seemingly outside the room to the left of mine, looking outward. They were knocking lightly and said twice quickly, Hello? Hello? Then it sounded like the door opened and closed. I was like, Huh. Okay, they must have forgotten what room they were in or something like that and someone let them in. I walk back to the main part of my room, and I hear shuffling again. I look out again, and I see a figure. Can't really make out what the person looks like, but I see them on the other side of my room this time, and again, hear the light knocking, and, hello, hello. Now I'm starting to get some weird spidey senses of some kind, like, what the hell is going on? I see the figure leave and think, okay, that was weird. Then I again start hearing shuffling. I start walking toward the hotel room door and hear a light knock on what sounds to be my door again. And I hear, hello, hello. And immediately after, someone attempts to open my door. Thank God I had the cross latch pulled over. Not the deadbolt though. My heart stopped as I stood there and watch the door hit the latch and fall back shut. I called the front desk and informed them that someone had just tried entering my room and I'm not staying with anyone else. The front desk attendant just replied, I don't have any housekeeping up there. To which I replied, Okay, well that's concerning. Can you please send someone up to check around? The attendant replied, Well, there's no manager on duty. To which I asked if I should call the police instead, because I was very worried for my safety. I would then start to cry a bit. She replied that I should do what I thought I needed to do. So I hung up, and again started to cry some more, and I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't want to ask for another room, because I was too scared to leave now. Ten minutes later, the hotel phone starts ringing. I was honestly feeling really scared to answer, but I did. It was the front desk attendant, and she said the police were going to be coming to my room, and she didn't want me to panic when I heard someone knock on my door. I said, okay, and hung up. I sat there and thought, how do I know that this is legit? Whoever tried to access my room had a key, otherwise how else would the door have actually opened? A few minutes later, as expected, I hear a knock. I looked out the peephole, and I saw two male officers. I didn't ask to see ID, which in hindsight, it probably would have been the smart thing to do, but I was so shaken up and not really thinking. I opened the door, and they asked what was going on. I told them all that I explained above. They said it was good that I had the cross latch pulled over, because the door would open if not. I responded, it's a hotel. What do you mean? What's the point of the access card then? And wiggled the handle. We were in the hallway talking with my door open. Then they took a pause and they were like, oh, it automatically locks? Again, I'm like, uh, yeah, it's a hotel. 
So then they had me shut the door and open it with a key to test it. And sure enough, it didn't open without the access card. Then they said it was probably housekeeping. I responded that the front desk attendant told me that there was no housekeeping up there when I called. Plus, it was 8.30 p.m. Why would housekeeping be coming by at that time? Unless, of course, I had requested someone to come by. Plus, I noticed housekeeping had already been by during the daytime because my trash was emptied and dirty towels were gone. They ultimately told me they thought that it was housekeeping and not to worry, but if anything else happened or I felt unsafe, I could call them. They also said if I wanted to change rooms, they were sure the hotel would accommodate this. I said, okay, while crying, and they left. Now I'm sitting in my room crying, laying under the covers in my clothes. I'm sure I won't sleep tonight. I'm also too afraid to change rooms because I don't want to leave this room. I have the cross latch pulled over, as well as the deadbolt locked. I think I'm safe, but am I being paranoid? Was it probably housekeeping? And should I be doing something different? Edited to add to the update, I'm home safe and promptly came down with a nasty bug, slowly crawling out of it though. Thanks for all the comments. I appreciate this community for making me feel like I did the right thing. And although some of the comments made me more paranoid. Example, people looking through the peephole from the hallway. Overall it made me feel not so alone. And distracted me for a bit while I was up all night. I think so often people are afraid that their reaction to a situation is over the top. And or embarrassing. But I'm glad I followed my gut and reacted the way I did to what I could do to be safe. I was able to speak with a manager the next day when she came in at 11am. Unfortunately, the response from her was very disappointing. Just like the night shift from the desk clerk and the morning shift from desk clerks when I checked out. Needless to say, I will never stay in this hotel again and will be avoiding this large chain as a whole. A few years back, I was living with my aunt and uncle after moving to a new state. They had just moved into a new home in a new subdevelopment. In this area, door-to-door -door salesmen swarm new developments and new bills for water softeners, cleaning supplies, solar panels, generators and the Kirby vacuum people. They wander the neighborhood all day knocking on doors, but were usually gone by around 5 p.m. This particular evening, I was home alone with my dog, a mostly black lab and an unknown mixture. He was roughly the size and weight of a full breed Labrador, but he had a stockier build and long, wiry hair. He was a gentle sweet baby who was upset if someone spoke harshly to him. I'd never known him to be threatening to anyone. Anyway, my aunt and uncle were out celebrating their anniversary. This time of year the days were getting longer and we would have full dark by around 8pm. It was about 7pm and starting to get dusky when someone rang the doorbell and knocked on the door. The door was one of those with a thick glass oval window and I could see the door and who was there from the kitchen. I was going to ignore them but unfortunately they could see me and continued to knock so I went to answer the door. My dog followed me but stood off to the side in the shadows of the dining room. The person at the door was a young man about college age dressed in a collared shirt and tie and khakis looked a bit like a Mormon missionary with style. He was thin and about my height, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9. I figured he was a salesman of some sort, but thought it was odd he was out this late in the day. I thought I'd open the door a crack, tell him I'm not interested, and then lock the door. I opened the door a few inches to speak through it, and he starts his spiel about Kirby vacuum cleaners, and he wants to come in and give me a demo. 1. It's not my house. 
Two, I know once they get in, they aren't leaving without selling something, and I have no need for an overpriced vacuum, and I don't have a thousand plus dollars to spend anyway. Three, I tell them, no thank you, I'm not interested, and begin to close the door. That's when he puts his foot between the door and the door jam, and throws his hands up to stop the door from closing. This is when I'm like, WTF, and I hear a vicious growling behind me to my right, and then a loud deep, bark, 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 as my dog lunges for the door. I grab his collar to keep him from going out the door. The guy's mouth drops open, his eyes get really wide, and he looks like he's ready to pass out or pee himself as he jumps back from the door and backs away saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wrong house, wrong house, and then turns and runs to the end of the driveway, where a car with three men in it pulls up to get him, and they speed off, tires squealing, and that's when I told my aunt and uncle later on about it when they got home, and we told a few neighbors so they could keep an eye out for the unusual behavior. It is possible they were a team of Kirby salesmen, they do travel in teams of four, and follow the door knockers in the car with the vacuum, but I was suspicious because it was late in the day for them to be knocking on doors, and it was a team of four men. Usually they have a team with two or more women in the group because they are knocking on doors at a time of day when women are going to be home alone and unlikely to let strange men in. So, to a team of Kirby salesmen working late to meet quotas, or a team of home invaders, I don't know, but Cosmo wasn't going to take chances. Hey, thanks for watching today's episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast. If you did enjoy, then make sure to leave a like rating and leave a comment down below letting me know what you all thought. Also, if you are a first time listener joining us for the first time and you did enjoy, then consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell beside it. As I mentioned in the intro, we do upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you'll hear on YouTube, so subscribe and look forward to more content. Speaking of stories, if you yourself do have a story that you'd like to submit, then do send it in with the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you and a shout out to all my channel members. Thank you to Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Robbie, and Susie. Thank you so much. Your support means the world, and it helps me with continuation of releasing brand new Scary Stories content and focusing more on the channel. Also, of course, thank you to the regular viewers who watch the videos, leave likes, comments, and share the videos with family and friends. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you all on the next episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.